So a welcome back. We're at another episode of the Eye Photography Podcast. Uh, this is Stephen and there's also Emily today. Hello, I'm here. So thank you very much for coming along because uh, uh, I think this will be a really, really kind of interesting little podcast we, we've kind of got set up because um, there's a lot of people, obviously, you know, who love to edit their photographs um, and everybody does it in such a different way. But instead of getting into the actual kind of the, the nuts and bolts of how to edit a picture, because we, we, we've done that on podcasts and I'm sure we'll look at it in future ones. And we've got courses covering it left, right and center. And even the wonderful Emily has done a brilliant course yourself about Lightroom and luminar haven't you i have i have i have i am the resident lightroom nerd uh, <laughs> i love all of those lovely sliders and dials <laughs> and you can see all those lovely sliders and dials in action with emily on top um if you go to learn.iphotography.com forward slash podcast i'll put the link in the description and there is some offers on there for our luminar and uh lightroom courses so if you want to see more of emily in high definition telling you all about how to edit you can do there um but today's podcast isn't going to touch too much upon those uh, lovely sliders and dials too much. Um, it's talking more about workflow, about how you're going to get your photograph from your camera to the final destination of whether it's going into an album or whether it's going online, etc. But more about the workflow, about kind of uploading your photograph, kind of creating a file structure, and then maybe kind of a little bit about kind of how you kind of prepare your edits and you do your exports somewhat. So we thought, yeah, we're kind of talking around the, the editing uh, kind of stratosphere somewhat. And because Emily does obviously so much photography, so much editing and so much videography, um, I thought it'd be kind of quite a good person to talk to about how to structure yourself because with the amount of weddings that you shoot and, and the video content, I imagine you have to be super disciplined in terms of where everything goes and kind of creating an order or or are you just pure chaos? No, I think um, I'm not the most organized person in the world, but this has to be organized because with, with the nature of my, my work, particularly for eye photography as well, it could be that we're, we're discussing a tutorial on light trails and I'll think, oh, in 2018, I was in Wales and I took this. So I, I need to be able to grab things quickly and efficiently because mm. I do hark back to a lot of different things that I've done in the past. Yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, I can understand that. Yeah, you just need like reference images every now and again. So a, a good structure will, will uh, be, be very, very, very helpful, which I will come on to very shortly, but kind of starting off from the very beginning. So let's say the scenario, you're taking your photograph. Um, now, there are a number of ways that, and again, I suppose they're all kind of helpful for different people in different situations, but the different ways of basically being able to get your photograph onto your computer. Some people do it, the standard kind of, take the memory card out, stick it in the computer. Some people do it through like a USB cable and hook up the camera and the computer. Um, some people, and I will admit, I've done it from time to time because I find it kind of quite easy, is just hook up your camera to your phone or your iPad or even your computer wirelessly through Bluetooth and transfer the images that way. But personally, Emily, what do you prefer? Maybe why do you do it that way? So if I'm editing on my desktop computer, I will use a card reader just because I have a, a number of different cameras that have different card types. So it's just easier for me to just mm -hmm. always put it into the same card reader. When it comes to copying it over, you know, if you've got Lightroom open, it might tell you to import that way. But personally, I prefer to do it without any other software intervention and just copy the whole contents, all the files, all the folders as is from the memory card into an organized folder. In that folder, it might have the date, it might have the location, it might have what the type of the shoot is. Uh, usually I have a, a wedding folder and then a personal folder so I can sort of differentiate between my work projects and my fun projects. Yes, I think that's it's. it's a, I think I would probably do it that way. I mean, I've as I said, the way I've used like the wireless technology that's ready for being able to show the image just on a phone really quickly because seeing it at three yeah. three inches on the back of the screen sometimes isn't that good. And and plus then you can you can share it really quickly. So it depends, yeah, on what you're doing for it. Um, I think you maybe answered my question, but just just to kind of um, just to kind of clarify because it was an age old question that we used to have uh, in the studio that I, I worked in that. I would always kind of um, basically take the images from the card, I'd cut them off it and then paste it to um, the folder that it was going to because then the images weren't on the, the the card at all and then sometimes I'd go back and format it. Whoa, you... you have to format it. Oh, Stephen. Oh, oh yeah. no. Oh, oh. Well, again, I suppose it's a two-part question now that you've given me something else to think about, right? <laughs> 
cut and paste or copy and paste? Copy, 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 copy. Always copy because you don't know if you have a power outage in the middle of this transfer. You don't know if that card might have one a corrupt image. Mm. So there's a lot of things. I, I shoot on two SD cards per camera as well. So I am the backup. I'm obsessed with backups. So I'll, I'll not for, I'll have a backup SD card. I'll put one in and then copy. And then whenever you're going out to shoot a new project, always, always, always format your card. You are just asking for, for corrupt things to happen if you just <laughs> delete them and don't reformat them, in my opinion. Well, here we go. Second part to that question then. Formatting in card or in cam, uh, sorry, in computer or in camera? Always in camera. It's designed specifically for that camera and it'll do the best job. And if you put the SD card in a different camera, always reformat it as well. It might be exactly the same. It might make no difference. It's just good practice because different brands will have different folder structures within the SD card. Mm -hmm. And the last thing you want to do is, is potentially mess it up and, and ruin your lovely photographs. Indeed. I mean, with you, obviously not everybody shoots um, with like two cards in the camera if, if they've not got it. But when you do, as you do for your work, how do you structure it? Is it basically the carbon copies of uh, of each other or is it JPEGs to one, RAWs to the other? I just carbon copy them to both. I have two 128 gig cards, which on most jobs that will that will be more than enough storage. Yeah. And then I know I've got two complete backups of everything. That's always good. Do you then go yeah. on to um, put them onto uh, your device hard drive or externals? So do you have two backups when it goes down that route? So th this is one interesting, for a nerd, an interesting <laughs> tip. Um, if you don't have the fastest computer in the world, or even if you do have a fast computer, it's good practice to edit either from your device's storage or like I do, which is a solid state external hard drive. Mm -hmm. Your solid state drives are a little bit more expensive, but they are much, much faster at transferring information. So if you start editing off like an eight gigabyte slow hard drive, it can slow down all of your workflow, yeah. uh, particularly if your computer isn't the fastest. Um, so if you edit from an external drive that's really, really high quality, it, you'll have a faster workflow. And then once you've done that, you, I use like a slower hard drive as one backup, one on the big, slow hard drive, one on the fast hard drive. And then eventually it will go to the cloud as well. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's, I suppose, another thing to think about for people is to, do they keep a, a local backup, you know, whether it be on an external hard drive or not, you know, somewhere in the house. And then also maybe have a slightly lower res version or again, the same high res version, but in cloud somewhere. Do you use cloud storage? I do. I use uh, G Suites, the, the Google business one, yeah. uh, but they do have personal plans as well. And I believe, I don't know if they've changed it recently, so double check, but my understanding of it was your JPEG uploads were completely like unlimited yeah. uh, with Google Photos. Uh, it might be a little bit more compressed, but you know, it, it, you do have like a copy of it on the cloud. Mm -hmm. When it's on my phone, I automatically just upload everything, all the JPEGs that way. Um, but using the G Suites, I will do, you know, as many of the raw files as, as I, I can feel comfortable with. Uh, it might be a matter of, of keeping the five starred images and deleting all the ones where I've accidentally took pictures of the floor or something. <laughs> um, but to be honest, I'm terrible at culling the raw files. I just tend to dump it all onto the cloud. Oh, yeah. yeah, no, I, I'm the same. I'm like, not saying I don't want to get rid of a picture, but it's like, well, what if I, you know, I get someone coming up to me and said, I need a photograph of a blurry floor. I'd be like, yep, I've, I've got, got loads of them. That's it. And if not, I'll just, you know, email Emily and she'll have a million have of them loads. instead. No, <laughs> I'm, I am terrible for not deleting anything. The cons of this is I'm awash with hard drives, NAS drives, <laughs> SSDs, and a huge monthly bill for cloud storage. <laughs> but the pros of that is it's, 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 it's not only my job, but like the thing that I love most in the world. And you've got to keep your photographs, particularly if they're digital and you don't print them out often, you've got to keep them safe. You absolutely have mm. to, because you'll be devastated if you lose them. And yeah. it's, it's, it's not just job, it's, it's my memories as well. Well, that's it. Yeah. Looking at it on two sides. Yeah. It's your memories that you can never repeat. Um, but as a business owner like yourself, it's your assets. They are the, that people can come back and buy more. Um, 
you know, if you, especially as you shoot a lot of weddings, you've got your bride and your groom are your main clients, but I'm sure then you'll also have kind of uh, secondary customers being the guests at the wedding there. So it's vital that you, you've got them to kind of come back to, because some people even going, I imagine, come back to you maybe uh, on anniversaries a couple of years later and say, oh, can I get this image blown up? And you've still got to be able to have that high res uh, you know, backup for it, don't you? Oh, yeah. I mean, th- there's times when six months later, the bride might get in touch with me and go, look, we've been showing them around the family and we don't have enough images of Auntie Tilda. <laughs> Is there any chance you can go through and see if you've got any more of her? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I've got nine million raw files. <laughs> of course I can. <laughs> <laughs> she wants some blurry floor shots at the same time. <laughs> I'll know. throw them in for free. And, but yeah. Uh, yeah, it does come in so handy because yeah. you never know who's in well you, you know generally who's important at the wedding because hopefully you want the couple to tell you but it might be a tertiary member of the family that they, they want additional footage of three months later and yeah. you know you could just say no but I, I, I think if I've got it I might, might as well it's a nice thing to do isn't it exactly and it's, it's building business it's building connections and if you're known for being so diligent like that and you know and you you have a good structure and a good workflow um then you become reliable um and then that builds up your reputation so i know we may be talking about something that's ahead of a lot of people they may not be running it as a business but i think if you just want to get in good practice like that you know if you then do start to turn your photography into a business and um, then you've got the right kind of mindset really um and with that continued i suppose the next stage I wanted to look at um, was about your folder management. I mean, you touched on it very, very briefly, but how do you kind of structure? Is there anything you kind of do you use like meta tags and things like that when you get into creating folders? So things have got, then they're all like geo tags. So you know exactly where they were taken and what date. Uh, and then you can basically just search for it. How, how do you kind of sort out your files? So our lovely fellow tutor, Rachel, who's, who's uh, the wildlife extraordinaire, she actually showed me during the wildlife course how she tags and, and geotags all of her images through metadata in Lightroom. It's a big part of that course. Plug, plug, plug. It's blooming plug, plug, amazing. Plug. Link like, in I, the descriptions. I, <laughs> I was watching it and learning things as I was editing it. That's how good it is. <laughs> and um, I realised that I'm not quite as... Um, organized as some people are like she she she'll put exactly where it is the species um Mm. the color the time of day and then all she needs to do in lightroom is put like sunset africa lion and the 10 times that she's been there and shot that they all just ping up it's it's amazing for me my file structure is a little bit more basic in the sense that i don't use metadata um they're all geotagged through my camera which is a lovely little feature yeah. but i do make sure um each year generally gets a folder generally gets a hard drive <laughs> to be honest <laughs> surprise it's not each month gets a hard drive for you <laughs> yeah and then it might be the date or at least the month and then um the location so if it's a holiday it might be you know 2019 march sicily and then in there i'll have a folder for each of my cameras so it might be my GH5, my drone, and my phone backups. I always add my mm. phone backups because I like the little snaps that I do on my phone. Yeah, as well. that's it. I think that's it. You you've got to keep a memory of everything because yeah, you you. I always say you took the photograph for a reason. You may yeah. not necessarily know it straight away, um, but sometimes then in retrospect you go, oh, I'm quite glad I took that. You know, it's it's, it's just kind of uh, say the memory collectors. This this is what we do as photographers. But um, so kind of taking a step forwards then from there so we, we've uploaded our image we've kind of put it in our folders it's all structured etc so normally the next step is you know we, we take it into our editing suites but and again i imagine that you'll all have everyone will have but people will have different approaches as to how they um, make some maybe basic adjustments or selections i mean especially with lightroom with you knowing it so well i know it has the filtering system that you can kind of flag or star or rate images do you use anything like that to help you kind of pick out the good shots from the week yeah so if it's a personal project i won't bother calling uh, if it's a professional project, I generally always call. Mm-hmm. Um, it gives you a, a refer- so calling is when you'll quickly go through each image and you'll either give it a five star rating if you want to edit it, three star rating if you're not too sure, and zero if you want to bin it off if it's a picture of my feet again. <laughs> 
It's a lot uh, of these feet. <laughs> do you know what I do it all the time? So I hold the camera in the crook of my elbow. Uh, it does a chip, 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 chip. Yeah. I'm sure there's a whole subgenre of people that quite like things like that. So we, we won't go on to it today, but it may be worth keeping whole things like yeah. that, Emily. <laughs> so um, if, 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 you know, because during wedding season in a typical year, I might have shot four weddings and then it might be a week or two before I even get to editing them. So culling not only um, makes me choose the images that are the best, but it also gives me a little bit of refresher of the day. And, and you know, it, it's a great thing to do before you jump into editing. So I'll five star all the images that I want to edit, three star the ones that I think I might be able to do something with, and then zero star and bin off the rest. From that point, um, I put one preset on that I use literally for everything, everything. It's in the preset packs in uh, the iPhotography, it's in the people, uh, and portraits pack plug, and it's plug, plug. blooming great <laughs> I use it for everything in my Lightroom setup I've called it something different for eye photography but in my setup it's called the everything preset I put it everything and it just works it's wonderful <laughs> and um, once if you do put a preset on globally to every single thing not only do you start developing your own style developing the color palettes that you like but it also makes your editing process much much quicker because instead of moving the contrast three opening the shadows on 300 pictures it's already done for you you just have to go in and tweak yeah yeah and that's it and that's the the beauty of presets that i, I know you're a big believer of that that they're not just a one-click solution as we always say there's there's sometimes a little further adjustments you need to make but on the whole, it trains you to be more consistent uh, and then it informs your photography kind of before that. Um, when you go to your next shoot, that you know you've got to shoot things in maybe a certain way with a certain amount of light to be able to reach that final effect that your, pro, uh, your preset will give you. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's very, very valuable. And I know Emily covers a lot of this if you're listening in her Luminar and Lightroom courses. So if you wanted even more detail about kind of how to use presets uh, and obviously seeing hers in action and creating your own, uh, you can do if you check out those courses so uh, always the opportunity to give a big plug and a big thumbs up for that wonderful course plug, 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 plug. <laughs> no it is honestly presets uh, change your editing flow you know it might be worth tr downloading a couple of different ones um to see what style you like because often if, if you're just like thrown in front of a load of sliders and you don't really know mm. what in, what you're working towards yeah. if you look towards different presets for inspiration then it gives you a great starting point yeah yeah and i i think you're right and, and also if you understand what all those panels and those adjustments do that you don't just solely rely on the presets and your images then don't end up looking like everybody else's uh, because they've all done the same thing. But you can then go look at it and go, actually, the preset's good, but it may be just need, I need to increase uh, the, the the shadows a little bit more and I know how to do that here and there, et cetera. So yeah, I, I think it's important to know the whole interface, but yeah, you're so right. The, the pretest can make things a lot quicker. Um, so kind of moving again, one step further forward. So say we've, uh, we've virtually edited our photographs and called them and everything now we get to the export stage um so exporting again i suppose it depends upon where you're actually going with the image whether it's for print or for online or etc cetera, etc cetera. but do you have different presets for exporting so my my export is very um i imagine you can do a lot more with it than i do but I just like to, I never compress, I'll leave them as, 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 as large as, as I have after I've cropped the JPEGs. Mm -hmm. And I'll make sure again, similar to the file and folder format, I'll put the, the, the location, the date, and then I'll usually do like a number system. It's usually like one, two, three, four, et cetera. We all know what numbers are. <laughs> <laughs> and then if, uh, for instance, I'm shooting something that I know might end up to be an iPhotography blog, Mm -hmm. or, or something that I want to use on my own socials where you need a smaller file format. I will export the whole thing again into a separate folder and call it like web sized. And then I'll just sort of make the long edge yeah. 800 pixels or whatever. Yeah. And then I know I've got the large, lovely, uncompressed versions and then the smaller versions if I need to. So you, you, you basically have two versions of your exports, one high res and maybe one kind of medium low res really is it yeah it's it, it saves time having to do it later if i do hark back to certain things yeah um and in that folder where we've done you know we've got all your different cameras in their own folders then we'll have edited uh high res edited web size and then i know if i find that folder i've got access to the raw footage the video files anything i've took on my phone mm. and then the full edited ones as well 
Yeah. And as time's and- gone on, <laughs> I've actually gone back, you know, like if it's like a 2016 holiday or something, I'll go back and do 2021 edits and see if my style's ah. changed. So yeah, I always go back and have a tinker. That's yeah, and I, I I've done that before, and I think especially over 2020 when uh, a lot of people were just bumming around, you know, couldn't get out, couldn't get to shoot what they wanted. I noticed a lot of people, especially within eye photography, doing re-edits, um, and I think it was a great opportunity and a great time for people to learn about editing because maybe they weren't shooting as much, and and so there they could sit down and have the time to understand all the different wonderful effects and, and things that editing can do. And I think it certainly made a big difference, kind of in the photography because normally they may have not had such a dedicated block of time to sit down and, and do things like that so I think those those courses have helped out immensely a lot of people but um I suppose again this is maybe just a more of a personal question um in, in respects to kind of what you do with your images once they're exported where do you like to kind of share them what kind of uh, communities websites etc do you find kind of quite useful photographers these days I think the main place that I share my work is Instagram And I've recently done, because we've been inside not being able to shoot new stuff, I've recently done 2021 edits of some of my old uh, holiday stuff. And this is a great argument for not deleting all your raw files, (laughs) because I've gone back in and looked at images that I've completely disregarded in the past. But now because my editing skills have maybe gotten a little bit better, I've pulled out some gems that otherwise, if I'd have just like done my original call and then binned them off, they would have been in, you know, they'd have been gone. So yeah, yeah. so Instagram is where I like to share most of my stuff. And I also do uh, YouTube uh, videos around. So say if I go on holiday, I'll do like uh, a photo video of where I've been. So it might be a little bit of a mm. vlog, a little bit of a story about where I've been and then show some of my best images that way as well. Oh, lovely. What's your, um, you give it a plug your, uh, your Instagram and your YouTube for me. So my Instagram is at Emily May Lowry, uh, L-O-W-R-E-Y, blame my silly husband for the silly spelling. (laughs) Is there? Hi, I love you. (laughs) And um, my YouTube channel is Micro Four Nerds. Microphone, nerds, brilliant. I love that. Yeah, I, I will put my hand up because I'm sure at times when I've written your name, I've spelt it the wrong way. I've put ER as opposed to RE. So. Everybody does it. <laughs> I think the birth certificates spelt it wrong. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> brilliant. But that, I hopefully, if you're listening, you know, it's giving you maybe some understanding on a how important file structure and workflow is um, and when it can help you out but also you know some tips about how to do it you know not to say necessarily you you always have to do it the way that we've been talking but um, you know I think they are some very very kind of good foundations to kind of get yourself into that kind of type of flow. Oh could I just leave us on my my favorite backup tip that I've learned over the years and it's called three two one. And what this means is if you have three backups, you really only have two. If you have two, you only have one. And if you have one, you could potentially have zero. If you assume that one is always going to fail, you're a lot more vigilant. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. Always assume tip. something's going to go wrong. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. Brilliant. Well, with that, three, two, one, and we're out. Um, yeah, if you've got any editing workflow tips of your own, then please get in touch. If you've got a slightly different approach to things, uh, we'd really love to know. You can email us at our dedicated address. It's tutor at iPhotographyCourse.com. You can find myself and Emily and the other tutors on Facebook. Um, twitter instagram all the other bits and pieces you can kind of find us on and anything we've been talking about today chances are we'll have links in the description to wherever you're watching or listening to this podcast um but yeah it's been brilliant emily another good little technical chat we like these little tech chats don't we i love them i love them I am not a nerd for nothing. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm sure we will do more. So with that said, we're going to leave you be and hopefully um, you've enjoyed it and you can follow and subscribe and catch us on more episodes and listen to the ones that we've done previously as well because there's there's tons of uh, information and everything we've put in there. Um, And yeah, thank you very much for listening and we'll catch you on the next episode. Bye-bye for now. Bye.